Good afternoon, and you're all very welcome to the IIEA webinar on the UN priorities in peace building. This is part of the Global Europe project supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs. An especially warm welcome to our guest speaker, the UN Under Secretary General for Political and Peace Building Affairs, Ms. Rosemary De Carlo. Before I hand over the floor after I've introduced her, let me just uh, put a few uh, housekeeping issues out there. Our format today will be a 20 minute formal presentation followed by question and answers. I would encourage you, our audience, to participate in the question and answers by using the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. You can send your questions in during the formal presentation and we will come to them later. For those of you who wish to follow the discussion on Twitter, uh, the, the um, hashtag is at IIEA. And a warm welcome also to those who are joining us uh, via YouTube as this event is being live streamed. Both the question and answers and the formal presentation are on the record. It gives me very great pleasure to introduce the Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, Rosemary De Carlo, formally to you. After a very distinguished career in academia and diplomacy, Rosemary De Carlo was appointed to her current role in 2018. She is, and this is really quite remarkable, the first woman to hold this position in the long history of the United Nations. And congratulations to you on that. Prior to her appointment, she served as a UN, US diplomat and had a distinguished career, including at the UN mission in New York, and also as Assistant Sec Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. She has served overseas and has worked in the embassies in Moscow and in uh, Oslo. We very much look forward to listening to you today and engaging with you on this very important topic. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, I'm pleased to speak with you today about the work of the United Nations in conflict prevention, peacemaking, and peace building. And I'm very pleased by your interest in our air efforts. Your engagement is crucial in building support for principled action in global peace and security issues. The world today is at a particularly challenging global juncture. The peace and security environment is deteriorating. We're witnessing renewed geostrategic competition. Conflicts are more complex and fragmented. They're also more regionalized and internationalized. They're more protracted and harder to resolve. The wars in Syria and Yemen, which we are trying to help end, exemplify this evolution. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to increased inequality, rising tension, and social unrest, as evidenced by large-scale pro uh, protests on several continents. Women and members of already vulnerable populations have been disproportionately affected. In many parts of the world, there is a crisis of legitimacy of institutions linked to a perceived failure of governments to meet the needs of their population. The recent epidemic of coups in West Africa is a vivid example of the consequences of this crisis. The climate emergency is exacerbating risks and creating new sources of stress. In areas like the Sahel, for example, farmers and herders vie for a shrinking share of arable and grazing land. Conflicts are becoming increasingly hybrid, fought on the battlefield and online. And disinformation and hate speech are widespread, crossing from online realms to offline action, engendering polarization and violence. In the last year, we witnessed a major escalation of conflict in the Horn of Africa, leading to a humanitarian crisis and allegations of crimes against humanity and other atrocities. In Afghanistan, the Taliban takeover has resulted in a complex political, economic, humanitarian, and refugee crisis and a rollback of human rights, especially for women and girls. And the war in Ukraine, beyond the senseless tragedy it represents for the Ukrainian people, has seriously exacerbated global tensions and divisions. These challenges and how we meet them have monumental implications for international peace and security. 
we're facing a we're facing a test a test of the effectiveness of the global collective security architecture and of multilateralism itself. The need to come together to rebuild a common understanding on how to address these challenges is therefore obvious. This is why the Secretary General reached out to the UN membership in his report, Our Common Agenda, in September 2021. As part of it, the Secretary General called for a new agenda for peace. This initiative has at its core the prevention of conflicts and the building of peace. With the range of priorities from reducing strategic risks of nuclear weapons, to placing women and girls at the center of our efforts, to encouraging more investment in prevention and peace building. As the Secretary General argues in our common agenda, to protect and manage the global, global public good of peace, we need a better understanding of the underlying drivers of conflict, a renewed effort to agree on more effective collective security responses and a meaningful set of steps to manage emerging risks. So what are we proposing to do, you might ask, and what are we doing? Let me just give a few examples. First, uh, there is a need to expand analysis and look at a wider range of stress factors that may trigger conflict or violence. Uh, for example, we're now incorporating a political economy approach as well as a gender and climate lens to our analysis. We're aiming for data-driven approaches to mediation and conflict prevention and we're investing greater efforts on new threats to peace and security. For example, most of our special political missions and peacekeeping operations are in countries that are highly climate vulnerable. Therefore, along with the UN Environment Program and the UN Development Program, my department established the Climate Security Mechanism, which provides analysis and early warning on the potential impact of climate on security. With this information, our representatives and envoys in the field advise governments on risk mitigation and work with local communities on resource sharing and other issues. Ireland, during its tenure as an elected member of the Security Council, has worked hard to galvanize action to address this double vulnerability of climate and conflict. Similarly, we're looking more systematically at the impact of digital technologies including the increasing central role that social media plays in our societies and how it can be instrumentalized for offline harm as we saw to devastating effect in Myanmar. Second, inclusion must be front and center in our efforts to promote peace and more broadly as a guiding principle for the United Nations. The rationale of the sustainable development goals to leave no one behind is a plan for inclusion. It's also crucial for peace and political processes. Women's full, equal, and meaningful participation, another area where Ireland has been an important champion in the Security Council, has to be a major priority. While progress has been slow, efforts such as the Syrian Women's Advisory Board and the Yemeni Women's Technical Advisory Group show that we can make a positive contribution to this agenda. The inclusion of youth across the various dimensions of the UN's work is also critical, particularly engaging young people in efforts to prevent violence and promote peace. Third, initiatives to prevent and resolve conflicts must take place alongside long-term peace building efforts that address the underlying reasons for violence. This is our approach to address complex challenges, such as in Burkina Faso, where fragility as well as the effects of the ongoing crisis in neighboring Mali, place significant stress on state institutions and political stability. Our aim is to support local authorities charged with taking part in dialogue, conflict prevention, and peace building. This is why, along with the UN Development Program, we deploy peace and development advisors to advise governments in 60 different countries and contexts, ranging from Ecuador to Nigeria, to the Maldives. Fourth area we are focusing on, as a growing number of conflicts or crises are felt beyond national borders, there's a need to increase regional approaches. 
through our regional center for preventive diplomacy for Central Asia, we've been supporting dialogue amongst the five Central Asian countries on issues related to the sharing of water resources. We're also placing great emphasis on working in tandem with regional and sub-regional organizations who are well positioned to respond to emerging crises for their respective regions. For example, our mission in Sudan is working with the African Union and the Intergovernmental Agency on Development to facilitate negotiations on Sudan's transition to democratic governance. And finally, there's a need to invest in diplomacy for peace and engage to find political solutions to long lasting conflicts. We spare no effort to capitalize even on small windows of opportunity. Our work in Yemen is a case in point. Our special envoy painstakingly engaged with parties in support of a nationwide truce, which commenced in April, 2022, and has just been extended for another two months. Although still fragile, this is a major milestone in one of the bloodiest civil wars in recent history. Before I conclude, I'd like to say more about the war in Ukraine. The General Assembly has made clear in two resolutions that Russia's invasion is a violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and a violation of the Charter of the United Nations. The war continues to exact a horrific toll on the people of Ukraine. The United Nations is providing humanitarian assistance, reaching over 7 million people so far and providing support to refugees and internally displaced persons. The war has set in motion a crisis that is also adversely affecting food security, global energy markets, and financial systems. It has already aggravated vulnerabilities in many parts of the developing world. This is why the Secretary General established the Global Crisis Response Group on Food, Energy, and Finance. The group is mobilizing the entire UN system, multilateral development banks, and other international institutions to help countries face these challenges. The group has just released its latest findings and they're chilling. Prices are near record highs for food. Fertilizer prices have more than doubled. The World Food Program estimates the ripple, ripple effects of the war could increase the number of people facing severe food insecurity by 47 million in 2022. For this reason, the UN is now working with partners to enable the safe and secure export of Ukrainian produced food and unimpeded access to global markets for Russian food and fertilizers to prevent a devastating crisis. The war is also having an impact that is less immediately obvious, but potentially just as dangerous. The violence has seriously damaged Europe's security architecture and threatens to undo the painstaking and gradual work of over three quarters of a century to durably rid the continent of insecurity and instability. The longer it continues, the more it will weaken the European and global institutions and mechanisms dedicated to preserve peace and security. A political solution to the war then is imperative for Ukraine, for Russia, and for the world. And that solution must be in line with international law and the United Nations Charter. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, let me start the discussion going by maybe uh, fielding a few questions myself. Uh, you talked about a test of global multi uh, of the global multilateral system, and it has been facing that test. Um, with increasing difficulty in recent years. And you also outlined a list of steps that you have taken within the UN system itself to develop better and better tools that if we had a more responsive system could be more even effectively uh, utilized. My, quest my first question to you and my second question is related to it is, given the paralysis uh, amongst the permanent members of the Security Council, um, do you see the, the General Assembly as being able to play a more effective role? And I'm thinking in the context at this stage of the Lichtenstein um, inspired resolution, which at least asked the those using the veto to come in and explain it to, to the uh, majority of countries. 
So that's my first question. Is this a positive sign or will this just lead nowhere? Um, and the second question I have is a resolution which Ireland co-sponsored with uh, Niger on the issue of, of uh, climate change and um, integrating such considerations relating, relating to climate security into the work of peace building and conflict resolution, but that was vetoed. But does that in any way inhibit your work in this area? Or are you able to continue developing your instruments in this area despite that use of a veto? Thank you. Thank you very much for, for both questions. On, on the first one, it's, become, it's obviously clear to the world that um, the Security Council uh, has not been able to come together on a range of issues over the last few years. It's been going on for a while, but it has reached uh, quite a, a, a dramatic point uh, now. Um, I do see that uh, regarding Ukraine, uh, several members of the Council resorted to the General Assembly, first for resolutions condemning Russia's actions, um, a, a resolution also um, uh, regarding the Human Rights Council uh, and Russia's membership there. Uh, and then of course, this latest resolution on explaining one's use of the veto. Um, I think, yeah, look, I think both bodies can play a, a huge role in peace and security. The, the Security Council is charged with that role, but it's not as if the General Assembly hasn't played a role uh, throughout uh, on various issues, humanitarian and others. Um, I would say uh, it's a positive sign uh, that members of the council now have to explain their vetoes uh, to the general membership. I'm not sure how much it's going to change um, their actions, uh, to be perfectly frank. I think when I've seen countries use vetoes, uh, whether it be Russia, China, or the United States, um, they fervently believe in what they are doing. Uh, so I think an, an explanation before the, the main body perhaps is not as daunting as it might seem to some of us. Um, I think, I, as I said, I think both can play a, a role here. Uh, I've seen the GA play significant roles on the humanitarian side, resolutions on Syria, for example, in the past. Um, I don't think, however, that one can really do away with uh, the Security Council, which really uh, produces resolutions that are binding uh, and form the body of international law. Uh, on the climate change resolution, uh, which uh, was a, a, a disappointment to, to many, um, obviously uh, I think it would be helpful for the world to understand that uh, the body charged with peace and security understands clearly the role that, that climate change can play on security. Uh, it hasn't stopped our efforts, and I will explain to you a, a bit more. Uh, first of all, we do have climate raised in several country resolutions, um, Somalia case in point. Uh, it hasn't prevented us from putting um, climate security advisors in missions. We have one in Somalia now. We're going to be putting another five um, advisors in different missions in, in the two regional offices in, in Africa. Um, Iraq and in Sudan, I believe, and I've forgotten the fifth. But we are we're working very hard to do that. Um, we we feel it's a really important issue to focus on. We know this is be going to become more and more of a problem uh, for stability and for security. Uh, scarcity of water will continue to increase, uh, and we know that that's one of the biggest concerns. Uh, and the, the, what, the one thing that affects the movement of populations that can lead to intercommunal tensions and even conflict. Thank you for that. I have a question here from Gufran Kulani. Um, let me read it out. Noting that the uh, Under Secretary General has previously called for the release of those arbitrarily detained in Syria, as the Assad regime continues to forcibly disappear many Syrians in areas under its control. One, do you have any hope for the release of detainees? And two, will the UN and independent monitoring bodies gain access to all places of detention? And three, will the fate and whereabouts of all those forcibly detained be revealed? What are your hopes in this regard? Okay, well, first of all, uh, I still have hope. Let me just put it this way. Um, 
we, uh, the Secretary General has called for the release of those detained. Our special envoy has made this a major priority of his work. Um, he has uh, uh, lobbied the Syrian government on many occasions, has traveled there, has tried to come up with initiatives uh, that could help uh, with the release of those detained. Uh, where do, do I think that the UN will gain access? I think yes, eventually the UN will gain access. Do I think that there's still hope? Yes, I think that there is hope. I think it's gonna be tough. I think it's gonna be very hard. And I think it's part of the overall situation in Syria. I don't think we can divorce it from other things that are happening in Syria, the conflicts that continue, the humanitarian situation uh, and the, um, let's say, um, in some ways, the marginalization of Syria uh, from you know, others in, in, in the international community. Um, I think it's important to keep speaking about it and shouting out uh, on this issue and not to forget it and not to assume that this will never happen. Will the fate of, of those uh, who have been detained or perhaps perish be revealed? Well, we certainly hope so. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, can I ask you a, a question? I, quite a few come in and out, but this is something I wanted to ask you myself. Um, you spoke earlier about working with regional organizations and so on. And I just wanted to ask you in the context of our particular focus on, on the EU, um, are you happy with the cooperation you have with EU institutions? And are there any ways in which in your area of work, you'd like to see it strengthened or improved? I'm, we're very happy. EU is, is a very a strong partner of ours, and we work with them on a whole range of issues. I'm going to give you one example. Uh, we had a, a quartet uh, that um, worked on Somalia. It was the UN, the EU, African Union, and EGAD. Uh, we started at the very beginning when there was you know, plans for the elections, working with them on uh, getting those elections um, on the books, uh, implemented uh, transition, a peaceful transition uh, of power, uh, and also worked together on um, the support for the African Union's force that is combating terrorist activity in Somalia. We've had a, you know, a tremendous uh, relationship with them on that. We work with them on a whole range of issues. So I can't think of anything that um, is lacking, frankly, in our, in our relationship. Working with them on Sudan now as well, uh, on a whole range of things. We've got a crisis uh, response group that meets regularly um, in different fora where we are cooperating at various levels um, with the European Union. Uh, obviously, um, the European Union has brought uh, resources uh, to many of the initiatives that the UN is involved in. We are very grateful for that. Uh, and. Um, is now working with us also uh, on the issue of, of Ukraine and the humanitarian response there, including getting food, grain out of Ukraine uh, and into uh, countries that are desperately in need. That, that brings me into another question. And this question is from Keely O'Sullivan, a development researcher at the IIEA. She says, you spoke about the impact of the war in Ukraine on food security in Africa and what steps um, is the UN taking with local partners in Africa to ensure the food crisis does not lead to further destabilization and crisis across the continent? Okay, well, we, our agencies are working with um, obviously countries in need, um, the World Food Program in particular, um, trying to assess what the exact need is, uh, what can be done, where the grain can come from, uh, grain and other products, because it's not just grain, it's corn, it's, it's sunflower oil, et cetera, that's so in need that um, uh, for which Ukraine was a big exporter and Russia as well. Um, and uh, there's been a, an effort to try to compensate, uh, to get grain from elsewhere in order to supply um, food, in particularly in Africa. Uh, but we, we're not going to make it without getting some of that, uh, of the supplies out of both Ukraine and Russia. Um, are you hopeful in that regard? I mean, I, you, you spoke about it in your address, and I know that a lot of this work has to be done behind the scenes and, and, and so on, but are you reasonably optimistic that, that there will be a resolution in that area? 
Yes, yes, we are, because uh, we've been working very closely with Ukraine, Russia, and Turkey. Turkey's played a major role here uh, in trying to broker, frankly, uh, the SG refers to it as a, a kind of a, a deal <laughs> um, the, to open up the port uh, to allow uh, grain to leave uh, from Odessa, uh, from the Black Sea area. Uh, while there are no sanctions on food and fertilizer uh, produced by Russia, um, there, there is a reluctance on the part of many uh, ship owners uh, to go to Russia. Uh, insurance costs are astronomical, as you can imagine. Uh, this, is a, this is a war zone we're dealing with. Uh, and we have to find ways also to enable Russia to export the grain. Uh, it's going to be absolutely necessary because they're both very large suppliers. And Russia, of course, for fertilizer is huge. But we are we are optimistic. The discussions are continuing, um, and uh, I, we're very grateful to Turkey for playing a very major role here. That's uh, that that's a very positive uh, statement, and thank you very much for for that. Um, can I just turn to another issue? And that is, I, I know that you have been working a lot on the question of involving youth in, um, in conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak about that just a little bit? What sort of initiatives are ongoing there? Is it involving digital platforms or how do you deal with this issue? Yeah, a lot of our work with youth uh, regarding you know, uh, conflict resolution issues is through digital platforms. Uh, we have man managed to with, uh, it's an AI driven uh, technology that we're using. I mean, we've reached out to like 500 people at a time. Uh, we did so in Libya uh, to get the views of young people uh, regarding um, negotiations that are ongoing in Libya uh, and uh, really trying to assess what they wanted to see happen. You know, what, what do they see as the future of their country? What role can they play? Um, also in Yemen, we've done a couple of uh, those dialogues in Yemen as well. Uh, we find it extremely uh, useful. This is something we started doing during the pandemic. I, you know, we, there was no traveling around the world uh, and we started reaching out more uh, virtually. But what we found was that we were able to reach individuals who normally are not engaged at all in such efforts. Uh, Yes, uh, technology is not uh, as widespread, perhaps, in certain parts of Africa. On the other hand, it's, it's spread enough for us to be able to, to bring people in in a virtual platform for discussions. That's major issue, you know, a major area where we're working in. But we do have a lot of youth initiatives, and the Peace Building uh, Fund is funding quite a number of them. Uh, the focus on bringing you know, young people and women into discussions about governance, uh, public policy, and peace processes, peace building uh, is really, I think, very important. It'll be a big emphasis uh, as well in the Secretary General's efforts uh, to implement all the provisions of his report, Our Common Agenda. Thank you for that. I, I was very struck when I was reading some of the, 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 the work you're doing in that area, reading about it, think to myself, well, this is so self-evident. Why did no one do it before? So, so it's, precisely. It's, precisely. it's amazing. Um, <laughs> but congratulations on that. Uh, There's a question here from Keen Fitzgerald, who's a security and defense researcher at the IIEA. And he says, uh, hydropolitics and the use of strategic damming has exacerbated climate risks particularly in the Tig uh, Tigris-Euphrates Basin and in the Lower Nile, threatening food security and leading to greater instability throughout the region. How is the UN engaging stakeholders and what work is it doing to limit the instrumentalization of water by those seeking um, to um, be hydro hegemons? Um, this is something that's being handled by the UN Environment Programme. Um, they're working you know, very closely with governments in particular and advising governments. Uh, on um, what really needs to, to be done to save, save the planet, save, make sure that water supplies are not affected, et cetera. So it's not something my department has really been uh, engaged in, but I can uh, assure you that UNEP is um, very heavily engaged in this area. 
Thank you. I have two questions now on um, uh, women and conflict resolution, and I suppose indirectly on resolution 1325. Uh, Suzanne Keating from the Department of Foreign Affairs asks, despite all the talk about prioritising women, peace and security, the recent questioning of the Roe versus Wade's ruling suggests that we are facing a, a devastating backlash against progress towards women's rights and gender equality. How is the UN reacting to being um, to bring renewed urgency to this issue? And another question is the Colombian peace process and its 2016 final peace agreement are widely held to be an international model for gender sensitivity and the inclusion of women's rights. What are the lessons learned and how can this model be replicated in other conflicts? And this question, um, it, it strikes me that in many of your statements, you are very careful to be very specific to a conflict. So can we take lessons from Colombia and can we apply them to other situations? Yeah, yeah. first, you know, on, on women, uh, it's, it's very clear uh, that um, the UN has paid a lot of attention to women's empowerment, uh, women's role in public life uh, over the last 20 years, uh, increasingly so, I would say. That said, that doesn't mean that we've made sufficient progress. I think we all understand it and agree. In fact, we see backtracking uh, around the world uh, to the point where um, you haven't seen a, a resolution on women's issues uh, in the Security Council in a long time. I mean, first of all, there are a lot of resolutions already that have set up norms that are needed or um, various initiatives like um, the special representative for conflict related sexual violence. But I think the underlying reason is progress could not be made. And there's not, a, no one wants to see any backtracking on this issue that ends up you know, in writing. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's a ongoing issue to promote women particularly women in, um, let's say, government roles, women, you know, female candidates for in elections, and of course, women at the table in peace processes, which is an area that we work in a lot. We work, in my department, we're working mostly on women in, in elections and in peace processes. Um, it is um, a struggle, uh, particularly on the peace process side, uh, in some parts of the world. I'll give you a few examples. Um, when, for the Syria Constitutional Committee, we have 30% women at the table. And that's because the UN insisted, we're running the process, we insisted on it. Uh, for the Libya Political Dialogue Forum, we had 22% female. Again, we were running that process, we insisted on it. Uh, when we brought um, the government of Yemen together with the Houthis, uh, back in 2018 uh, to uh, open up the port of Hodeida, there was one woman at the table, no more than that. Uh, and I think if we were to have a, a, a another, let's say round table uh, with the Houthis and the, the government of Yemen in one room, I'm not sure we would have more, uh, even though we would be running the process. Um, so it is, a, it's a challenge, but we're gonna continue at it. Um, on the issue of Colombia and the peace process, yes, it is. It's incredible. Uh, it is. It's a model. Uh, the provisions and, and, and the, the gender sensitivity in you know the various recommendations and, and provisions of that peace process, very helpful to integrating women. Uh, I think it's a reason why I believe it's like 39% now in the parliament are female. I think it's a reason why women have managed uh, to really make inroads uh, in in public life and in, in governance. Are there are things to replicate. Yes, yes, but not entirely. Let's put it this way. I mean, the societies are different, but there are a number of measures I think that can be looked at and, and floated, let's say, as we try to come together with peace processes, whether it be in Libya uh, or Syria uh, or uh, even Yemen. Staying with Yemen there, um, Seamus Allen asks, are you able to comment on the prospects for a lasting peace solution in Yemen? Well, we're very pleased that we finally have a truce. Uh, it, the first the truce was brokered for two months. It's been extended for another two months. Uh, it may sound like a minor issue, but it's a huge issue for us. Uh, it's an opening. Uh, we have the sense that there is a desire 
to stop the fighting, uh, whether that can really happen and whether the truce can actually turn into a peace agreement. Um, you know, we, we will keep trying to do so. Uh, I think the, the, the key here is the, those who are supporting both sides. Uh, and uh, there has to be a desire, not only of the parties on the ground, but those who are supporting them to halt the fighting. Uh, but we will continue. Uh, we also, I mean, as part of this truce is an opening up of Itai's Road, which had been closed for a very long time. Uh, flights leaving Sana'a for um, Amman and Cairo. Um, ships, more ships coming in. Uh, so uh, there's some, there's progress. Uh, it's fragile. It's modest, uh, but it's a beginning. Uh, but again, we need the, the support of the international community in order to push this forward. Do, do you find inevitably that given the uh, disharmony between the, the, the larger powers that it's difficult to get that, to harness that type of support in various conflicts around the world at the moment? I think it is. I, I think it definitely is. Um, on the issue of Yemen, I don't think there's much of a disagreement in the Security Council, frankly. Uh, the disagreements are with countries who are not on the council. Uh, and, uh, but it is, it is difficult uh, to see the council coming together in a range of issues. Libya, for example, Syria, uh, it's much, much more uh, effective uh, if we can get a, a kind of consensus in the international community for certain efforts. Myanmar, another case in point, difficult. Um, Valerie Hughes from Ireland Syria Solidarity asks, as Russia looks set to veto cross-border aid from Turkey to Idlib in July, how is a humanitarian catastrophe for millions of Syrians to be avoided? I think our, our goal is to get um, a renewed authorization for cross-border delivery of assistance. My colleagues who carry out humanitarian activities uh, have made clear uh, that that is going to be absolutely necessary. That cross line is not good enough. It has to, we have to have both cross line and cross border. Um, I believe we're on our sixth um, uh, cross line delivery, uh, uh, but you know, six in a year's time is not enough. We need, we need that cross-border. Uh, we are speaking to the Russians on this. Um, and uh, again, we are, we are hopeful. Here is a, um, here's a, another question. Um, it, it's quite complex, but I don't know if you could, I think it would be interesting if you could maybe give us some idea about, you, again, coming back to this idea that each peace process is quite specific to the situation. Um, how does the UN go, go into a, a particular situation and begin to develop, use or implement the tools that you have available to you uh, that you are developing to avoid uh, conflict uh, breaking out? Like what's, I know you don't have an off the shelf. Uh, what's mm -hmm. your normal, op how do you normally operate in this way? Okay, well, for, first of all, we have to be wanted. <laughs> uh, and so we have to make sure that uh, the parties in question are not averse to having the UN, having the UN involved. And, and sometimes they are. Uh, and, it's, and sometimes it's better for another party uh, to lead a process or, or lead discussions. Um, I mean, first and foremost, um, you know, first thing, you got to find somebody who, who knows, knows the, the terrain. Uh, you know, what, what culture are we talking about? What country are we talking about? You, you need you need to have, make sure that you've brought on your team somebody who can understand better, let's say, than others, um, what is happening in a, in a given country and how to reach out. Uh, speaking with the parties in question, obviously, but always, 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 there needs to be a friends group of some kind or countries who will support uh, the efforts of the UN and support the efforts of the UN in such a way as talking to the parties in question when needed uh, as a way of reinforcing messages. Uh, that's absolutely key. Um, and when we see that um, the international community is divided, let's take a Syria case in point, we had two different groups. We had the Astana group and we had the, I forgot the like-minded group and I've forgotten what they actually call themselves because they don't really do that much anymore. Uh, we tried to get them together 
uh, the Western group and the Astana group. You know, never the twain shall meet there. That was, it just was impossible because it would have helped tremendously uh, in dealing with um, the Syrian crisis. Um, in the case of Libya, I mean, we are, we work routinely with a group of countries, not who are all in agreement, uh, who will help move the process forward for us. Uh, there's the bigger group, um, the Berlin process started by the Germans, which is a quite a large group. But we've got a smaller group that's representative of people in that group coming from different perspectives uh, who are in helping us and engaging themselves with the parties on specific issues that we think is really important. Is that and a challenge? Sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, Rosemary. Is that a challenge to have a, a group um, of, of um, a contact group type situation where you have the main actors or the main influencers? Is it a challenge between having too many people in the room or too few? Yeah, it's a challenge. Absolutely. Too many people in the room doesn't I mean, lends moral support, but doesn't necessarily help you in, engage. Uh, too few, particularly if it's skewed to a particular side, doesn't work either. I mean, you really need you need to have you have to have countries who are willing uh, to engage, but also are really interested in seeing a resolution. Yeah. Even if they disagree on how, what the resolution should be of a particular crisis, but they have to be interested in that resolution. So that's a pretty tough decision. Uh, there's a, a question here then, uh, another question from Seamus Allen. Um, uh, are you able to provide um, a comment regarding the use of economic sanctions against aggress aggressors? Um, do you have views on the potential benefits or risks of, of economic sanctions? Because we have seen that while they're very effective, they can also have unintended consequences. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, on, on sanctions, actually, my department oversees the UN sanctions committees uh, that have been established, the monitoring groups and sanctions committees. And we've seen where, yes, indeed, sanctions can have, can have benefits in changing the behavior of certain parties. Mm -hmm. Um, and the risks. Uh, and often the risks are uh, more because there is overcompliance as opposed to lack of compliance. Uh, in that, for example, I mean, none, none of the sanctions committees uh, that are UN run are um, target humanitarian assistance. Anything that's humanitarian is, you know, is not sanctionable uh, within the the Security Council context. Um, that said, what we see often is that member states, individual companies do not want to take the risk. So, so there's an overcompensation. We're seeing a bit of that right now, uh, frankly, with Ukraine, where there's over, um, overcompensation in implementation of some of the sanctions. You know, companies thinking, don't want to touch it because there are sanctions and, you know, even though food is not sanctioned, don't really want to touch that. It's you know reputational risk, potentially um, uh, crossing a line, not realizing it, etc. We've seen this on Iran, for example, uh, with sanctions on Iran. Um, so it has to be really, really carefully constructed. Any sanctions regime has to be really carefully constructed. And certainly, I mean, as I said, for the UN humanitarian, it's, we never have sanctions on anything humanitarian. And the Security Council has been very, you know, clear on that. Um, but that often is that's not, let's say, it often translates again into lumping everything together. And can I just ask, because I think that's a very important issue you're mentioning there. Um, is it will they accept your reassurances? Um, you know, this un is not against sanctions, or does it require some of the more powerful governments? to come out and say clearly to their companies, there's no, there are no sanctions on shipping food or humanitarian it, goods. Absolutely, it requires the, the, the countries themselves are saying it, it, trying to explain a sanctions regime. First, we don't try to explain things that aren't ours, but uh, it, it's gotta come from the countries themselves. For example, on the issue of export of Russian food and fertilizers, um, the US has said, that they're willing, they're willing to issue what they call confidence letters uh, to companies to explain. 
these items are not under sanction. Not only do we uh, not are not uh, are we not opposed to what you would do in, ter in terms of uh, shipping grain, uh, we promote the idea that you do it. Um, and this is gonna it, this is needed because, as I said, this uh, there's a sense of reputational risk. Um, venturing and dealing with a country that might be under sanctions for whatever, uh, to e extend to all kinds of other areas. Well, that's that, that, that's very that's a very interesting point. Uh, it's another question here from Alex Conway, who is a, an EU affairs researcher at the IIEA, and he's referring to the peace process on the island of Ireland, and um, the impact on that of the decision of the British government to unilaterally revise the Northern Ireland Protocol to its Brexit agreement with the EU. Um, do you have any views on, on, on this issue? Well, this is an issue I, I would leave to, <laughs> to, to, to Ireland, uh, the UK, uh, and the EU, I would say. I mean, certainly, uh, look, uh, there's been, you know, you know peace in the area for quite a long time, and that's, that's, that's the goal going forward. Peace and prosperity. Yes, um, thank you. Um, and it's a question from Ekaterina Tarashova, and she asks, and I think it's response to your earlier, um, uh, an earlier question to which you replied. And she asks, how do you remain hopeful about Russia's cooperation when they've shown such a disregard about international laws and norms? Uh, okay, I think uh, let, let's, we're talking about food and fertilizer here. We're, we're not talking overall peace process, right? Uh, because of the indications they've given, uh, because I don't think they want to be perceived as a spoiler in the developing world. Uh, I think uh, Russia has obviously maintained close relations with a number of countries uh, over the years, continues to do so. Uh, and certainly um, at this point, um, you know, is, is concerned about its reputation uh, going forward. Uh, and uh, we've had indications that they want to help resolve this problem. Uh, and um, we will take them at their word and, and do our best to try to make this happen. Um, I'm, we've had a, a wide range of questions. So if mm -hmm. you'll permit me, I'm going to end with a personal question. Okay. Um, sitting, where, sitting where we're sitting now and, and we look in at the UN and we see deadlock by and large. Um, but sitting where you are um, there, you see problems to be solved. How, how do you manage to motivate, continue to motivate people, your own staff included, when you see the difficulties you have to sur surmount to get the smallest uh, achievement? Well, frankly, it's not very hard to motivate them. They are, I have a very moti motivated crew. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, we take small gains uh, as, you know, hope for larger gains. Uh, let me put it this way. I mean, case in point, Yemen. We, I mean, we were dancing for joy. A two-month truce was a huge thing, given what's been going on in that country. Uh, and we want to turn it into something longer. Um, similarly, uh, you know, as you mentioned, the food, food crisis and uh, the export of grain and, and other products. Um, we're willing to keep at it until we get some traction and success. Now, do we always have success? No. Uh, let's look at Syria, where it's been dragging on since 2011. Uh, and it is very sad. And um, refugees not willing to go home, understandably so. They don't feel the conditions are right. Uh, our role is to take care of those refugees uh, as best pos as possible. Um, do we see a light at the end of the tunnel in Syria? Well, we see one that where that could be a light, but we don't see the sides being able to, to reach it. Um, so I think there's just the, the sense that it, it can happen. I was, you know, talking to a colleague who said, you know, remember it took over 20 years uh, for North Macedonia and Greece to negotiate <laughs> the name of the country, but it happened. <laughs> so, yeah, peace peace comes dripping slowly. And uh, the words of the poet. Thank you so very very much. I've really enjoyed um, listening to you, and I started off feeling 
um, quite pessimistic. And somehow you have managed to motivate me. And especially, I think, again, looking at the example of how you use what you have available to try and make some progress. Thank you, Mary. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.